You're listening to the Weekly Wrap-Up on Sprott Money News. Well, greetings once again from Sprott Money News, SprottMoney.com. It's Friday, June the 7th, 2019. This is your Weekly Wrap-Up. I'm your host, Craig Hemke, and joining us as usual on this really fun Friday morning is Eric Sprott himself. Eric, good morning. Hey, Craig. It's uh, been a great, great, great week, and I find it so ironic that uh, you and I have to do Q&A here when there's so much going on in the gold market and the precious metals market generally, but let's try to do both. I hope everybody settles in for a long weekly wrap-up because you and I are going to be here for a little longer than usual. Uh, and you're right, we had an amazing response uh, to the what we announced last week, that we would be accepting questions and trying to answer as many as we can. So thanks to all the Sprott Money customers who sent in their questions. We're, I, I mean, there's more than we can answer. Uh, I've tried to combine a few. I, we'll, we'll get to as many as we possibly can. Maybe we'll roll a few over to next week. But thank you, everybody, for writing in. Uh, we really appreciate it. Uh, but let's just dive right in, uh, Eric. It has been uh, a very interesting week. Following on to the big run last week, gold's up about $40, silver's up about $0.40. Cents. The payroll numbers in the U.S. today were lousy with downward revisions. Uh, pressure is increasing on the Fed with an inverted yield curve. It certainly seems as if... A lot of the things we've been talking about all year are coming to fruition, and uh, this year is unfolding a lot like it did back in 2010. Yeah. And, you know, I want to start off by going back to last week's comment when I said, you know, I saw this guy do this technical write-up where he, he said, you know, it looks like it's just going to rally hard here, and uh, which I was surprised at at the time. This is about 10 business days ago or 8 business days ago, something like that. But there we are, boom, 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 every day uh, gold's been up. And including today now, if it kind of holds in here with the lousy jobs numbers. But I want to remind people that what his targets were, 1450 was the measured target. He said he thought it would go beyond the measured target and go to 1650. I cannot overemphasize what a 1650 price will do to the precious metal stocks. Yeah. I can almost guarantee you they'll all be up 100%. Not all of them. But yeah, like a lot of them will be up 100% in that kind of an environment. So sharpen your pencils, figure out what you should do, and uh, try to be active here, okay? And I'm, that's not to say it goes up in a straight line, but it sure looks good. And uh, one other thing I want to talk about before we get into the Q&A is a term that I ran across this morning. Uh, the annotation of it was ELB. I thought, wow, what the hell is ELB? And, of course, it's a Fed-speak term. It means effective lower bound. And effective lower bound means zero interest rates. And the discussion at the Chicago Fed meeting was, well, we've seen an example of interest rates going to zero in Japan for 30 years, and nothing happened Nothing happened. What are we going to do? What are we, the Fed, going to do if we get to the ELB and there's no reaction? And, of course, what it implies is you need a massive, uh, aggressive move by the Fed into markets to make things rally. And, of course, the whole process of going into markets and buying stocks like the Japanese ECB, uh, Japanese central bank does, uh, buying bonds, making it go up, take, and having zero interest rates, take people to gold. We can now see why 1650 is not unreasonable. That gentleman's extended target was 21 to, I think, 2400. And having got, if he gets to 21 to 2400, then has a D decline. The E wave target is 5,000. You can see it. If this is what central banks are going to do, just print huge amounts of money. They're debasing the currency, and it will just take a little marginal improvement in uh, gold demand for the price to react violently. So stay the course. Yeah, Eric, I think that's a, the, the best advice you can give anybody at this point. And, and again, the, to note that it's not straight up. It, you know, we're going to be fought by the banks every step of the way. You know, there's, it's always going to be two steps forward and one steps back. But yeah. you and I have discussed this, this year is finally that launching point where the, where the tide goes out and the central bankers are exposed, you know, that they've been running this confidence scheme for the last nine or 10 years. 
And now people are waking back up, you know, to where they were in 2010 and 2011 and going, hold on just a minute. Uh, where, what is going on here? And the fact that the Fed realizes that monetary stimulus only lasts so long, okay? <laughs> and and uh, the, the minute it starts wearing off, of course, mar- stock markets start falling. And, of course, that's the one thing they don't want to have happen is the stock market falling. So they're going to be forced to come back in. Otherwise, everyone's going to know exactly what they did wrong. And, of course, whatever the, the answer is will be wrong as well, but it'll just delay the ultimate. Yeah. Eric, one last thing before we get to the Q&A. I know you're uh, fundamentally based in your analysis. Are there, are there any price levels you're watching, though? I know, like on my side, I'm watching 1360 in gold because we haven't had a weekly close above 1360 since March of 2013. And so something above there would, I think, get a lot of people's attention. Are there, are there yeah. levels that, that you watch, too, and like in silver, sure. too? Yeah. Well, let, let's deal with gold here because it's been the leader and it's the one I sort of focusing to see whether it's going to lead silver, which it will, of course. Um, but I would say the downtrend line from I don't even know when it was back in 16 or whatever. The downtrend line, I think, probably gets pierced at like 1352 or three, something like that to get to a new closing high. Uh, 1360 is the number you mentioned. And of course, to to hit an intra market high, I think we got to, did we get to 1370 or 1365, something like that. Yeah. So those are all kind of key numbers. I would have thought that the 1353, you know, breaking the the down sloping wedge, might bring a lot of technical guys in, but definitely a, a, a weekly close over 1360 might seal the deal. Well, that gives us something to root for. And with the FOMC planning to meet again week after next, we're talking uh, June the 18th and June the 19th. Boy, a lot of focus is going to be on that, and I know you and I will be talking about it next week. Uh, For this week, though, we probably better get to some of these uh, questions that have been sent in. Again, thank you to everybody for sending them in. And I've got quite a list, and Erica, I'm just going to lay them on you, but guess what? You get to take the first two off. Uh, the reason I say that is because I can answer the first two. How about that? So okay. uh, one of them is actually to me. I, I, it's not the weekly okay. wrap up with Craig Hemke, but uh, nonetheless, uh, the first one had to deal with basically, if I were to summarize it, why don't the silver mining companies get together and withhold uh, supply and uh, and force the banker's hand? I, I've asked uh, Keith Newmeyer that before, and he's very quick to point out that the government would never allow that because you'd basically be forming a cartel. Um, and that that would never be allowed. I would imagine uh, you would probably see it that way too. Yeah, what we need is we need a foreign cartel. Right, exactly. <laughs> but American... where, the, where the government you're referring to has no say in it. Yeah, exactly. And it's kind of like an OPEC thing, right? Yeah, exactly. Uh, and one of the problems is there aren't many really large producers, but there are some, you know, of uh, Peñoles and I think it's KMPG and Russia and a few other companies like that got together they could probably do something about it uh but you know what i think we have to let the market take care of itself here and 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 we might be very close to that happening anyway so yeah somewhat academic next question uh someone had was about uh the actual debt to gdp ratio in the u.s because they see numbers of uh 100 percent and 75 percent i think a 75 percent comes from kind of system apologists that are trying to find a way to spin it in a certain direction. I'll just give you the actual numbers for the person that wrote this in. Uh, the U.S., uh, as they compute it, total debt is $22 trillion or so. The dollar value of GDP in 2018 was $19.4 trillion. That gives you a jet debt to GDP ratio of 113%. Now, you can play with the numbers and come up with something else, but that's that's the easiest way to do it. Okay, so then, Eric, on to the questions that uh, I'm going to run past you now. Had a, several questions about something called Bonterra Resources. Do you have anything to say about that? Well, I'm an owner of Bonterra um, and uh, was an owner of Metanor. So on the merger, I, I think we have over 10%. Uh, they recently brought out a, a 43-101 where I think – uh, uh, reserves and resources were pushing two million. I don't know whether it was just over, just a little under. Of I think it was pretty good grade ore too. It was like eight and nine grams. Uh, Metanor or Bonterra has a mill, the old Metanor mill. Uh, so it could uh, it could get into production in a hurry, 
And I'll tell you that one of the things I look for uh, today, today, now that we've seen this rally, is companies that are in production, where, of course, the price increase manifests itself in the reported numbers very, very quickly. So Bonterra could be one of those because I think they could start that mill up on pretty short notice. So I like it. Uh, I don't know whether I haven't really looked at the quote recently, but I would imagine it's put, put in a bit of a rally here since gold went up. But that's the co- kind of company where, you know, with a let's say a two hundred dollar increase in the price of gold, the earnings outlook just went up by a hundred percent. So that that would certainly fill the the bill for what we're looking for. Yeah. All right. Next one. Uh, someone wondering about the short and long term outlooks for Sokomon's Moosehead project. Yeah, okay. Well, the stock's done poorly. I mean, it's it's cu- cut itself in half from, I think of it as a 15-cent stock, and I think it's at 8 or something. Um, I thought the results were pretty good. Uh, the market doesn't seem to want to pay for those things. I think there are, I've always believed there are forces at work in the junior miners that work against stock prices going up. Those guys might find themselves in a bit of a jam here if uh, things just start generally going up because money wants to go back into the area. So I, and I like the fact that it's in, the belt that it's in encompasses the uh, the Marathon Gold deposit of Leprechaun, which is a very it's a low grade, large low grade, but they're starting to hit some high grade. So I think the logic of why they could have a uh, significant deposit geologically all comes together because of the the trend that it's on. So I'm quite hopeful that they'll continue to. Uh, hit some pretty big intersections, and uh, it could carry for quite a distance. Well, I don't know much about that, but after the week we've had, I'm definitely going to be knocking back a few moose heads this afternoon. I can tell you that. <laughs> Good for you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, we're going to get back to uh, uh, just kind of a, a – I want to go back to Bonterra real quick uh, just to elaborate a little further on the relationship between yourself, Kirkland Lake, Osico Mining in relation Osisco. to Bonterra. Osisco. Osisco. I'm sorry. Yeah. 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 Well, Osisco's in the windfall camp, which uh, uh, Bonterra's in the windfall camp. And Osisco's had some stunning uh, drill drill results, but they're very deep, but they're stunning, okay? They're kind of almost Fosterville-like. Um, and uh, Kirkland owns a piece of Osisco. Uh, Kirkland owns a piece of Bonterra. Uh, oh, uh, Kirkland has expressed an interest in the windfall area. Uh, I'm not suggesting that uh, it, the time for Kirkland to step up their interest is now. I'm not suggesting that. But you know it would be on the radar screen at all times, uh, particularly with uh, with them having so much cash yeah. almost sitting idly around. And uh, they could do it probably by buying Osisco, because that's, that, that's the guy with the, I think their reserves are something like two and a half million ounces, something like that, at maybe six or seven grams. So I think, the, I think something will happen in the area. That would be my guess, that somebody will come in and consolidate it. Whether it's Kirkland, whether it's o- o- Cisco buying Metanor, or sorry, Bonterra, uh, I would think that somebody will do something there because it, it makes sense to have all the ore bodies under one roof. Uh, and down the list, there was something about uh, asking for your opinion about this windfall lake. Uh, can you go yeah. debt, uh, on the well, results there? Sure. Well, I like I like what they've done. Uh, they're finding some very significant, uh, well endowed gold areas, but as I said, deep. Uh, I'm not a student of Osisco's drilling results. And here, one of the reasons is they probably got like 300,000 meters of drilling results, and I am not the person who can take the time to figure out how it all uh, comes together. Right. Um, so I don't know. I mean, that's, that's up to some geologist who wants to spend weeks and weeks and weeks studying every intersection. But it certainly looks like they could have a very major deposit. I, I think it's going to be a camp. I think, you know, when you put Metnor, Bonterra, um, and windfall together, that's, that's, you're talking, uh, we're probably already talking 5 million ounces here. So that's a very good start. And uh, drilling just goes on a pace. So I think I think windfall is going to be uh, a significant uh, gold camp. All right, I've got a list here now of several uh, company-specific questions. We might just plow through them just with your quick thoughts on each one. How about that? Yep, yep, yep. All right, let's see. Someone wants to know about ore and resources. you know anything there? 
This is the one in, uh, is this the one in Finland? No, this is, in, they have a project in Peru. Uh, this, oh, uh, that, some, okay, Peru. Yeah. yeah, okay. I'm not uh, a, a, an owner of the one or in, in Peru, uh, so I don't have any comment on that. All right. How about Exelon Resources? Exelon, yes, I'm a very mm. large owner. Uh, they've had a, a litany of problems. <laughs> Whether it's uh, they converted the mine from a wet mine to a dry mine, and it almost got so dry they they, they couldn't deal with things. Um, they've now recently had issues with uh, the treatment charges they have to pay. I gather they've gone from like three hundred a ton to two sorry thirty a ton to two hundred a ton, uh, which of course just kills margins. But it is, I believe, the highest grade silver uh, equivalent mine that's operating in the world. Um, so if Silver wants to put on a move here, uh, that's the beauty of someone who's kind of just breaking even, and all of a sudden you're not just breaking even, you're making a lot of money. So yeah. I I haven't bought any recently, uh, but but then again, Silver's been a little stubborn in its move, which could change very quickly here, right? I mean, you could see yeah. once Silver goes through 15, I mean, it could be at 16 in a heartbeat. So uh, that that would be uh, that that would bring some buying back into all these silver names. I have not been a participant in silver names recently. Uh, thinking gold is the leader here first, and of course, when I say recent, I can change in a week too. <laughs> you know, yeah, I suppose. <laughs> next week you might say, well, "What have you been doing?" I've been doing nothing but buying silver stocks this week. You know, because silver's gone through fifteen or some darn thing. But all these stocks are going to improve dramatically from here, in my opinion. Um, you made a great point last week about high cost producers and how their earnings can go from a dollar to two dollars, right? If you go from twelve hundred to thirteen hundred, and and what yeah. great leverage that gives you. Uh, yes. do, you do you think uh, Keith's company, First Majestic Silver, would you consider them a high cost silver producer? No, I wouldn't consider them high cost. No, I think they're uh, they're a moderate cost, so they're they're not as leveraged as some other ones. Okay. Um, like he's he's run a very good ship there, yeah. and he's had decent margins, uh, certainly at the mill at the mine level. So uh, I no, I wouldn't consider him a high cost. He wouldn't be as levered as some other ones. I mean, the other ones that would be levered. I mean, these are companies in the garbage dump. I can't even think of the names right now. But yeah. I mean, there's a lot of them around that are you know got silver deposits where they can't get funding to develop them, and and or guys that uh, are just about ready to file bankruptcy or something. That's those are the ones that will go up the most. All right. How comparable is Wallbridge today to where Kirkland Lake was in 2015? Ooh. Uh, well, I would say not because okay. 2015, I would say it's not comparable because in 2015, we kind of knew that Fosterville was definitively going to make a major contribution uh, to Kirkland Lake. Okay. We knew that pretty definitively. Uh, we've had some great drill results at Walbridge. Uh, it's, uh, I mean, you know, it's a, a company I love. I love the fact they got this high-grade uh, ore body that keeps getting bigger. And, you know, even that ore body could be a one or two million ounce high-grade ore body. Uh, we still have more drilling to do to prove it. We're showing good continuity. Um, but it, it takes time. Uh, the one thing that, we, I mean, I could change on a dime here. For example, there, there's other holes to be released here in, in what we call the low-grade area, Area 51. I mean, if they came out with a 200-meter hole of 1.5 grams, wow, would I say that analogy of Kirkland in 2015 works? Yes, I would say that. So if you saw a 200-meter hole, 1.5 grams, particularly there's one at either end of this thing, one about 700 meters apart, man, you know we're onto something big. So right. we have to st stand by on that, and that, I hope that changes in the next week, too. Do you know anything about Golden Predator Mining? Yes. I'm an owner of Golden Predator Mining. Uh, I haven't been a buyer of it recently. Uh, they're up in the, uh, I guess it's noon of it. Uh, they have a, something called, I think, the Four Aces property. It's, uh, they've had some great results. Uh, it's orphaned. Uh, it would come back. I mean, it'll it'll come back in the playing field if if gold and silver want to go. I mean, the, all these stocks are so sold out. Yeah, they're trading at values yeah. that are unheard of vis-a-vis -vis the gold price. Unheard yeah. of vis-a-vis -vis the gold price. Yeah. No one gives them any credit for surviving. Yeah, <laughs> let alone prospering. So, 
I mean, I like it. I own it. I've never sold any, or maybe I sold some once at a buck seventy-five. I think it's probably down at I don't even know what it's now, fifty cents or something. Uh, but they'll all rally, you know. If, if if this thing is good, if gold's for real, right? It'll they'll all go. All right, three more quick companies, and then a, a few broad topic questions. Okay. Uh, DeGray is it one we used to talk about? What do you think now? Yeah, yeah, DeGray Mining. Uh, as we've discussed before, the Pilbara has not uh, provided us the results that we all might have hoped for, I guess, say, two years ago yeah. now. Yeah. Uh, when we started off with these huge high grades coming out of Comet Wells, and then, then it's sort of been muted uh, response so far, that, you know, we're, we're not even getting a gram a ton. But uh, I'll tell you one thing. A gram a ton or half a gram a ton could be very valuable soon. Yeah. I, I just bought a, st- a company who I think had a, 500 meter drill hole of like 0.6 of a gram. I'm just buying it on a punt. It's called Tudor Reserves. I'm just buying it on a punt because you know if gold goes to 2,000, wow. Yeah, that'll work. You watch the Pilbara come back to life. You yeah. know, you mm-hmm. could do it on half a gram <clears throat> when, when the stuff's on surface like that. So uh, that that would be the one thing that would bail all of those companies. You know, DeGray also has a. Um, a, uh, a, 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 a what's it, orogenic gold gold uh, deposit on a shear structure, uh, which might be pushing a million ounces. So, I, I the one problem they have is they got a, a big payment coming up. They got to make to uh, pay some loan off, I think, and they haven't solved that dilemma yet in terms of where they're going to get the money. Uh, this uh, this rally in gold might help them solve that problem. Okay. You know, that somebody might be prepared to put up the money for something like that in this environment. So uh, they still got some work there to do. And uh, one last company question. You're still excited about Royal Nickel, RNS? RNX? Um, well, I, you know, I, as I said before, I didn't like the fact they bought the $50 million mill and they put themselves in Hawk again. I mean, Hawk, and then yeah. you're going to have to pay these. Uh, very difficult interest rates if you don't have your own money. Uh, they, they've announced a second, uh, well, Father's Day like, like, but very modest discovery. And it, it's like, I think it was like five or seven meters from the Father's Day vein, but it was only a thousand grams, a thousand ounces, okay? The Father's Day vein, I think, was 35,000 ounces or 32, and this is a thousand so far. So there's a big difference, okay? Yeah. But, the, but the fact that it's nearby and it's, it manifests itself is one of the reasons that I have the position I have in the company, that I'm pretty certain they can find other Father's Day veins type structures, plus they have uh, the low-grade uh, gold that they're mining. Uh, I just think that, you know, not doing much mining right now and sort of having to report the results they're having to report and then having to deal with the issue of borrowing money uh, in a mill that I don't think they can really fill, um, you know, the market might wait a little. It, it's reacted quite nicely this week on the uh, second uh, Father's Day discovery, I guess we'll call it. Um, but I might mention that it's a modest discovery so far. So, but, but maybe they found other things. I, I, when I look at what the stock's done recently, it, fe- it feels to me like they might have found more than a 1,000 ounces, but we don't know it yet. As I look down the list, I found two more, Mavericks Metals and Alexandria Minerals. Either of those two? Okay. I don't have any comment on Alexandria. I know it's been involved in all sorts of uh, changes in management, things like that. I, I think I own a very small piece of it, but I don't really, I don't know it well enough to comment. Uh, Mavericks. Now, Mavericks uh, has the, um, the royalty on uh, the Beta Hunt Mine. I think there was just a big change in the ownership there where Goldfield sold 19.9%. And my friend Tom Stanley at Resolute, I think, bought a big piece of that. And he's a very, very smart investor. Um, so I, I haven't, I don't own it. I've looked at it because they had the RNC um, option or, or uh, royalty. Uh, but I, have, I don't own it. Uh, but I'm sure it's with, if Tom's in there, maybe I should be looking harder. Okay, here's a fun one. Uh, as you know, Canada currently has zero gold at the yep. central bank level. Uh, the question simply is, what are our central bankers thinking? Do they not understand the reality of holding devaluing U.S. treasuries? 
And is this a sign of a bottom? Well, you know, it's almost like they're locked out because they're absolute stupidity of selling the gold at the low. They caught the low in the gold price at around 250. Absolute stupidity for a central banker, okay? Not that central bankers are that smart. People give them a lot of credit for things, okay? And of course, the one thing we all love about the Fed is they, they're so irresponsible that they keep things together. But there's a price to pay in the end, okay? And of course, the, the fact that they sold our gold at those prices, now it's whatever, six times higher or five times higher is is enough uh, of a statement about how silly it was. And, uh, you know, they're, they're probably, you know, for them to admit that they should buy it today, even though we have new central bankers buying gold every month now, new ones, uh, you'd think we might uh, finally come about and maybe they should read the uh, go, uh, dealing with the ELB and what it means in terms of printing and buying and supporting and whatever and devaluing your currency. So, um I would think they'd be well advised to buy gold here, but I don't think they shall. Yeah, they're probably not listening to you or me or anybody else. Uh, but, you know, what can you do? Uh, all right, here's a fun one. Um, this person says they hear a lot about the uh, supply deficit in silver that's been going on for years. I know Steve San Angelo has been writing about that extensively. Yeah. And how the actual physical supply is very tight. Are there any ways of measuring that in terms of how much silver is actually available and how much additional demand would really pressure the market? I don't know that there is. I mean, I, I used to spend a lot of time looking at silver. And I finally realized, you know, it doesn't matter what the supply demand is. It matters what happens in the COMEX. Right. Uh, until, until physical demand matters. Until. And, you know, I'm always waiting for, well, when is that day when you can finally see the, the whites of their eyes and you know that they don't have the physical silver? Um, I don't know that we're there yet. And, of course, one of the encroaching problems is J.P. Morgan has a big supply of silver. And I can't hardly imagine that we're on their team, if you know what I mean. Right. Um, now, what they're going to do with it, I don't know. I mean, if they're going to be on Team Central Bank, which they probably are, I don't think it's going to work for us. I think it'll work against us. Um, but, yeah, I mean, it, it, you could have a tightness in silver so fast. I mean, if a few big hedge funds came in and said, I want to own some of this stuff, it would be over. For yeah. silver. I mean, you could buy, you know, maybe there, there's a billion ounces around. It costs you $15 billion. Like, what's the big deal? You know, that's a Ray Dalio. How about Ray Dalio puts as much money in silver as he put in gold? It would turn it around immediately. Yeah. So, anyway, yeah. it could happen anytime. I think that'd be a pretty easy profit for him, but uh, something tells me he yeah. probably would get the word real quick that they wasn't supposed to do that. Um, well, and not only that, but he buys a GLD to own gold, well, yeah, which that's I find too. ridiculous. Yeah. But anyway. All right, just a couple left. Uh, this person admits they haven't bought any physical metal yet. And he's also worried about holding stocks in street name at his broker-dealer. Do you have any opinion on that, on getting certificates, that kind of thing? And, and, and how is Sprott Money holding metal at Sprott Money more secure than holding something in a Canadian bank? Well, we have our money, at, uh, the gold and silver deposited, through the auspices of the Royal Canadian Mint. So we have a, a government institution, a not levered government institution, that holds our gold. When you're at a bank, uh, you have a levered institution. And just so that we all remember, back in 08, Citigroup traded at a dollar. A dollar. Yeah. Fannie Mae was at a dollar. Freddie Mac was at a dollar. GM was at a dollar. They were broke, and yeah. they had to get bailed out. So that can happen to banks. It's not going to happen to the Royal Canadian Mint. All right, Eric. And then uh, just last two. How has the last eight years, and really it's been more like six, uh, impacted your long-term view for gold and silver? And then do you have just a simple price target for the end of the year for both? Okay. Well, first of all, I've always uh, looked at the data and suggested that gold and silver are massively undervalued. And, and you see what happens on the COMEX, okay? I mean, it's just so obvious. When some guy comes in and sells $2 billion worth of gold and drives it down $15, okay? I can guarantee you that guy was not trying to maximize the price that he was getting for his gold, okay? He was trying to minimize the price he was getting for his gold. For, for an ultimate goal 
of getting a bunch of others to follow and drive the price down. So it's been very, very frustrating since 11 to see all the shenanigans that have gone on in the gold and silver markets, maybe even more so silver than gold. Um, and, and yet, you know, and, and I, of course, I base this on, look, I was there in 00 when gold was 250 and I was a buyer. And, uh, you know, I wrote it all the way up to 11 when it went to 1900 and I owned all the stocks. And, you know, it was a huge, huge payday. And I've always believed that we will have another payday like that. In fact, I was reading an article about uh, what happened to gold in, in between 70 and 80, and it went, as you know, they, they stopped uh, converting the dollars to gold, uh, the Treasury did, and the gold price then I think was 35, and it went to 800. And there was mention of a stock that was trading at $0.07 cents that went to $380. Yeah. And, he, and the guy was making the in, in the 80s, most gold stocks traded between fifty and a hundred dollars. Yep. Most. So that's. I kind of hope that we come back to that. And there's, of course, a price to pay for patience. Uh, but there's a reward for patience, and maybe this reward uh, will be realized this year. I hope so. And now that I understand what the Fed's likely to do, uh, because it's going to play right into the hand of a lower dollar and a higher gold price. So make sure you don't miss the train. All right, last question. I saved this one for last because I thought this was interesting. And it's just simply as, Eric, if you could have anything in the world, what would that be? And it doesn't have to be a tangible, you know, material thing. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, How about one. a long, happy life? <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's right. In fact, I learned the secret to great wealth when I was in uh, India. And I went to the Oberoi Hotel, and Mr. Oberoi owned it, and he had a huge uh, network of hotels. And, of course, there was a description of Mr. Oberoi, and he lived to be 105. And I thought, you know what? You make it to 105. You got a lot of compounding in front of you. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. <laughs> That's, you know, you probably got two more compounds than the average guy, or, or five more than the average guy. So... And, of course, at the end, it's the compounding effect of, of winners that's significant. You know, uh, let's say I bought gold at uh, 250 and maybe there'll be a day when it goes up 25 bucks or 50 bucks. Well, you know what? That's 1% and 2% on your investment, your original investment, that day. Maybe it goes up 100 Now you make 4% on your original investment that day. And it's, it's the compounding effect of having a winner that just keeps going. So, uh Long but you got to be able to you got to be able to enjoy your life as you're getting there. Okay, that's right. That's right. Well, all right. Thank you for all that, Eric, and and thank you again for everybody writing in. And just to let everybody know, I mean, we have a whole team at Sprott Money dedicated to answering your questions about precious metals, precious metals investing, storage, all that stuff. So if you have any interest in precious metals. Any additional questions we didn't get to today, the team at Sprott Money would love to chat with you. Just simply give us a call, 888-861-0775. Of course, if you're looking for great deals on owning physical precious metal, you can go to SprottMoney.com and check out all the great opportunities we have there as well. The precious metal should be an investment for everyone to consider especially with the way the markets are going right now. Eric, uh, thank you. It's going to be a very interesting day. It's going to be a very interesting week next and a very interesting Ooh. month with this FOMC Ooh. meeting pending. I look forward to talking to you next Friday. I will most assuredly look forward to that as well. And from all of us here at Sprott Money News and SprottMoney.com, thank you for listening. Have a great weekend. <laughs>